Lars Croyer, welcome to the Maven Money podcast. I've been very much looking forward to this, my friend. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. And uh, where are you talking to us from? Uh, Central London. Um, I'm actually at the WeWorks of a friend. Which I was going to say, I want the specifics, the mighty WeWorks, which are... Uh, the, the less mighty than it used to be, WeWorks. Uh, yeah, hot topic at the moment. We could unpack this one. Let's. Uh, and the story is, we're still on chapter three, let's say, of chapter 10. We don't know where it's going. I think some of the WeWorks employees hope that there will be 10 chapters. <laughs> You wrote a, uh, a famous book in the personal finance uh, space, Investing Demystified. I believe it came out in 2014, and you've uh, rehashed it again in 2017? Yeah. That's, is it 16? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, okay. Right. Just a quick um, point on that, really. Um, uh, the writing process, quite straightforward. How did you find that? Well, you, uh, I think it's hard to generalize. It was, uh, you know, I wrote one book before that about my experience as a starting and running a hedge fund, and... Uh, that book ended up doing quite well. So the publisher came back and said, do you want to write another book? And I said, um, uh, sure. And uh, and I didn't want to be the guy who wrote about hedge funds. So I wanted to write about the topics in the second book, which is something that's sort of close to my heart and actually something I studied academically a long, long time ago. So the process of writing, it wasn't so hard because I kind of knew that I, you know, what I wanted to say, if that makes sense. And I always tell people this, like if you're interested in writing a book, I know very few people that can't do it. I think it's a lot like write, running a marathon that once you've done one, you realize, yeah, it was hard, but it's also quite demystifying to do. Does that make sense? No, I like it. Um, we agree on a lot of things, uh, as we said before the podcast. Hopefully today we're going to try and unpack some of the things that we disagree on. But, you know, it's, uh, it, it's minor disagreements, let's say. So just a very brief history of, uh, you know, uh, yourself over to you um i'll brief us so, well, so I'm, I'm danish uh, yep. I've been there since uh, 1990 which at this point makes me old uh, but i lived in the u.s for 10 years where i did all my education i moved to london in 99 i worked at a hedge fund for a couple of years then in 2002 started my own fund uh which i ran um with some success, I guess, until early 2008. The early has subsequently become important. <laughs> Very uh, important. Um, where I returned all capital and just continued with just my own money. And uh, since then, I, I should say, in the interest of transparency, I still sit on the board of a number of hedge funds, so five to be exact. Um, wow. And I have written, um, as I mentioned, a couple of books about finance. And and I'm also involved with a with a charitable type organization called Ally Crowns, where we try to use technology to increase uh, capital flows to the uh, very poorest countries in the world. So that's sort of roughly what I do. Okay, a couple of questions on that. So, uh, what was the day to day life? of you while you were running your hedge fund. Give us a bit of an insight of what happened there. A typical sort of day that sort of spread out over a week. What happens? You wake up super early, do you read the papers? What happens? I get up at 6.30. I lived in Notting Hill. My office was in Mayfair. So I think my standard, and yes, I did shower. My standard was 25 minutes from bed to desk. Um, wow. Early. Um, and um, so I'd be in the office at seven or sometimes a little after seven. Um, markets would open um, at eight, very a little bit across Europe, but not a lot. Um, we mainly dealt in European markets, which had the advantage of not being time zone. Yep. Um, some of the stuff we did was slightly market related, so news mattered. Um, but otherwise, it's. It, the, the firm, well, hedge fund is such a, you know, such a varied term. It covers so many things and covers the, all the way from like the boiler room type firms that you see in the movies to places that like seem like libraries to places that are filled with, you know, <laughs> server computers. So there's not anyone. Mine was probably something closer to the library than to the boiler room. Um, so there was a lot of research, a lot of talking to companies and analysts and managements and traders and eventually putting on trades. Um, and we, um, you know, had a bunch of colleagues, so there's been a lot of time talking to them and debating trade ideas. We, uh, but the thing people often forget when they actually run a hedge fund is how much of your day is taken up by, you know, stuff that's not investing. Um, you know, talking to investors and then an auditor comes by and then some lawyer with some new fancy idea. and the Regulator. 
Yeah, actually, they, we didn't see them that much. <laughs> no, but they're not in a good or in a bad way. I just don't think they, they unless you're like Bernie Madoff, I don't think they, they pop by a lot. <laughs> you know, also, this, I'm not, I don't think their job is easy, but, but um, you know, obviously you want to be in regulatory compliance, but you also have compliance consultants to make, to help you with that. But so, you know, so it's it it really exciting analytical work. It was really uh, interesting. Uh, I think one of the beautiful things with a firm like that is there isn't sort of a, a massive bureaucratic organization that sort of takes on a life of its own. So, you know, if, if things aren't productive, if meetings aren't productive, or you aren't productive, just don't, <laughs> if that makes sense. So it's not like there's some other floor where it's all, you know, where they all make up the rules that you live your life by. Um, and then what we try to do was to create um, a market neutral portfolio. So we would be religiously hedged against um, movements in markets, currencies, interest rates, and so forth, and still try to generate a return for our investors. Okay, so you were quite un- unconstrained. I guess I answer the question because what did my day look like? So I've been vague enough, but there would be a mix of research meetings, analyst time, talking to my colleagues time, much less than people think of like going out to lunch and dinners. It, you know, that's sort of a different part of the business. I probably typically finish at 6, 6.30 in the evening. Uh, very rarely work weekends other than I very often bring stuff home with me to read. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that, you know, there was some travel. I probably average uh, five travel days a year where it goes to companies and management and sometimes investors. So you say that was another part of the business. You mean uh, sales was a bit more the whiny diny side of it, i.e. to try and find new money? Um, yeah, it doesn't really work like that. I think that's a misconception. It's not like, you know, I hope no one would give me money because I bought them expensive red wine, right? Sure. It's, you know, it's not, that's a diff, I, like, I think the, the, the sort of boozy nights and it was more on the trader broker side than right, yeah. the side of the business and yeah. not to generalize, but, um, when our investors keep in mind, we're very often big insurance companies or pension funds or fund the funds or ultra high net worth people and you know they don't you know they all have plenty of friends they don't need me to take them out to dinner and <laughs> yeah they're fly, flying above that um, um, it, were you pleased once you called it a day as such just in terms of your lifestyle back you're a bit more sort of then nimble what, what were your thoughts yeah. at the end of it so pleased i think you know i thought it was an incredible adventure i was you know i started this when i was 30 i finished when i was 36 um Still felt young. Um, I thought, you know, that was exciting. I thought, it, you know, it's an industry where you can make a lot of money very quick or lose a lot very quick. <laughs> um, and uh, I thought, I sort of appreciated having had the opportunity. I think in hindsight, I probably didn't love the business of active investment enough to be one of these guys that always wanted to do it. You know, I have a lot of friends in the industry and and frankly, it's all they want to do. It's, you know, they love, they just love it. Like they would do it if it paid like a school teacher. Yeah. I didn't think I had that in me. And, but I probably, it took me getting away from the industry to be um, appreciative of that fact, right? Which is also why now um, when I sit on the board of these firms, it actually works really well because I kind of enjoy being involved. And I kind of enjoy being helpful, but I don't have to be in central London at 7 a.m. analyzing businesses. Nice. Had you played out your strategy through the great recession or the great sale or the great panic, however you want to frame it, would yeah, you have been market neutral. coast or we market neutral? So we probably would have done very well, but everyone says that. Yeah. So okay. the truth is you don't know how you would have acted. We certainly would have done a lot better than people that weren't market neutral. We certainly would have done a lot better than people that were, involved with all sorts of dubious credit instruments. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's also possible that the day before the crash, I had decided to buy everything, right? I don't know why. <laughs> yes. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a parallel universe where I know what would happen. So just following on from you sort of closing up the hedge fund, as, as it were, um, did you achieve FU money? And how was your life sort of different after, after you felt you achieved that? Well, it, yes. Yeah, so I think essentially, not to avoid the question, but <laughs> yes, by any reasonable standard, I made a lot of money, but also not a lot of people that made a lot more money than me. But sort of besides the point for me, because, you know, as I said, I was 36 years old. 
I love working. I love challenges. And I had a background to go do a lot of interesting things. And if money was important to me, I'm sure I could go go make more money if that if that was what made sense. Um, I was more to say that it it gave me incredible freedom to do whatever it is that I wanted to do without having to worry about paying the mortgage. And um, and that I think is is is, is something that to this day I try to uh, you know be appreciative of. Sure. But I know I didn't answer the question. I also don't know what F, FU money is. is it's, it's, it's a relative concept and it constantly oh, changes. Yeah. Said, could I buy a car? Yes. Could I buy a house? Yes. You know, could I buy a uh, Chelsea? No. Yeah. <laughs> you mean Chelsea football team? <laughs> yeah. And so it's, you know, it's, um, it's uh, you know, that, that's, and, and again, I think, I'll tell you one thing, a study that I think is super, super interesting that I believe in is there was a study made um, and it's supposed to the longest running academic study ever. And it started in the 1920s and it's ongoing to this day. They tracked 50 students uh, from Harvard University from then to the, to basically from graduation to the day they die, right? And they're still doing it. I wasn't one of them, but, 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 um, the one thing, there are a couple of things that are really important for long-term happiness. One is enduring friendships. One is obviously health. Um, a positive factor is a uh, happy marriage, but not as much as you would have guessed. Money is important, but up to a shockingly low point. Okay, so basically once you have a roof over your head and you can provide for your family and can eat, um, from there, the marginal increase in happiness as a result of money is very, very low. Now, I believe that. I really, really believe that. Um, so I could have 10 times as much money or a tenth the money. I don't think it would make me any more or less happy. And I think that's really, really true, actually. So this whole, like, FU money, you know, I have friends that have private jets and I have friends that struggle to pay the rent. And I'll tell you, there's shockingly little difference in their happiness. <laughs> No, I, I I would agree with that. Great answer. So now moving on to the book you wrote. This is, I suppose, you're giving back, trying to demystify investments as the as the book sounds, which is could be argued the opposite of your previous career. But then over time, you then decided actually, for most people, this is probably the the smartest way for them to invest. So over to you with the book. What's the book trying to do? Yeah, so first of all, I, I don't think they're in good system, and I'll, I'll explain why that is. So basically the book is, if you take this as a starting point, is how should my mother invest her money, right? You know, she, um, the first thing she should do is she should recognize who she is and how she has absolutely no chance whatsoever of competing with the aggregate knowledge of the financial markets in picking individual stocks, bonds, or any kind of securities, and once she comes to that realization and come to understand and embrace that, I'm um, trying to, first of all, to get her to that, to, to understand and embrace that. And second of all, I'm trying to tell her what she should do on the basis of that premise. Uh, so that's what the book is in short from an investing perspective, but a lot of things follow on from that. And the very short answer is that she can actually create an incredibly robust portfolio, both from a theoretical and a practical perspective, if she buys just two investment products, one of which is for her equity exposure, which is called the return generating portion of her portfolio. She buys the broadest, cheapest, and tax optimized um, index tracker, uh, equities index trackers, and she get her hand on. So this will be some sort of a global equities index. Um, that's where she hopes to make money. The other part of her portfolio, she buys a government bond in the currency that's of you know, uh, her domestic currency and of a maturity that roughly matches a time horizon. This is not precise science. Um, so now she has two products. And depending on her, and so they have to be tax optimized, and that's important. Yeah. But depending on her risk profile, she combines those two to suit her individual needs. So that could be 100% equities, it could be 100% this low risk investment, or it could be 50-50. And you know what, then she's done. That's her investment portfolio. And she will be, in my view, better off than 95, 99% of investment portfolios out there. And Long term, yep, agreed, yep. You will virtually have paid no one fees, that's important, <laughs> because fees matter a whole lot 
in the compound and return space. And then um, that's sort of the main thesis of the book. And we can go into a lot of the things that follow on from that. Why not other things? How do you think about risk? How do you think about tax? How do you think about calamity situations? And so forth. How do you think about insurance, which I think is an interesting area? Um, how do you think about pension? Stuff like that. But then, like, if you took nothing away but just did that, you would um, you'd be far better off. Now, let's uh, speak about this a little bit further. So... Uh, something I've changed my mind on when I first came into the business. I thought you were buying an index tracker, and I thought you would be average. I thought you'd be average forever. But then I really understood what was happening here. When you buy the tracker initially, you are average. But then every year you own that, you become a slight outperformer. Just like over a 10, 15, 20-year period, very few fund managers will beat the market. If you are buying just the market anyway, then it's very few fund managers will beat the index. And it took me a while to sort of unpack this in my mind. But still to this day, people think buying the index is average. But long term, every year you hold it, it starts to become an outperformer. As you said, you will beat 95% of your neighbors if you buy an index tracker pound for pound and keep it for 10 years or 15 years. Why is it so hard for people to understand this? Why why do they want to fight against this basic math? This is basic math. So, yeah. yeah why why well, do people find it so hard? There are a couple of things that go into that. First, this conventional wisdom is an incredibly powerful force. Second of all, index investing is less old than you think. I mean, I was at university in the early 90s, and we were taught the virtues of mutual funds because they had diversifying benefits. Index investing is really a natural extension of that. I mean, I travel all over the world, and there's still a lot of countries where you can't buy index terms. Yeah. You know, or they're taxed horribly and efficiently, or yeah. they're on what you'd call access products or like stuff, ways to actually buy them. Yep. So it's, you know, it's happening. That's also, I think, so that's, that's a couple of points. Another point is just what is an index? Like, you and I could create an index right now of uh, companies with a CEO named Bob. Like, that would be an index. Right? It would be entirely pointless, but it would be an index. So there are literally hundreds and hundreds of indices out there. And, you know, so you can almost say some people are engaged in index picking as opposed to stock picking. <laughs> it's all very confusing. So it's also important which index you buy. Yep. So, so it's absolutely, your math is absolutely right. You know, picking an active manager for most people is, is not a good choice. But there's also the fact that, you know, if you take 100 active managers trying to outperform the, the, the FTSE, well, over a 10-year period, say 15 of them do, and the rest of them underperform because of, call it bad luck, but mainly because of fees and expenses and so forth. Yeah, now, yeah, one thing you can be absolutely assured of is that those 15 that outperform are going to be on all the billboards, and you're sure as hell going to hear about, hear about them. So yeah. Even how it's like an arbitrary fact, you you know we're enticed to to hear about the winners. It's a, you call it selection bias, right? It's sure. Um, as as Jack Bowles says, it's not a money business; it's a marketing business, and that is yeah. you know confirmed by how they shout from the rooftops. You know, you've never seen a fund advert where they've not been one or two. You know, they just wouldn't. Well, focus on a lot marketing. of the passes do. So if you're Fidelity and you run hundreds of funds, you know someone's always going to be number one in something. Sure. So, you know, so and that's where the marketing dollars go. That's where it goes. They're running a business, I think. Um, yeah, they're doing exactly what they should be doing. You know, maximizing you know profit shareholders via the way they do it. Um, you mentioned costs quite a bit, which is important. I also like the fact that you do focus on this fact that once you get this, you get this invest and forget, buy and hold, be disciplined, never sell. It frees up all of this time, which mm-hmm. a lot of people can't grasp that. So over to you on that. Think of it this way. Suppose you're picking stocks and you're spending your days picking Google versus Facebook versus the farmer companies versus the oil companies, what have you. And over a long period of time, you generate, say, 10% return in a market that's up 10%. You know, there is no value added. Right? You could have bought that by a, a, an index tracker where you paid 0.1% a year. And all of that time, would be the same. But let's now suppose that you, instead of 10%, make 12%. Um, so you have 2% outperformance. Uh, that over time, by the way, amounts to a lot. And a lot of people are very, very guilty of only remembering it when they outperform. So that, by the way, so people tend to do far less well than they think they do. 
Yeah. But, but even so, let's accept that that was the, that was the case. Now, if you can accept that you could just buy the market for nothing, you all that time you spent was just for the 2%, because the 10% you could get for nothing. So it's only the outperformance you're getting paid on. Now, suppose you're running a 100,000 pound portfolio, and, and, and you're spending 10 hours a week trying to generate that 2%, it's called alpha theoretically, but the outperformance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's 2,000 pounds a year for 10 hours a week times 50 weeks or 40 weeks, call it. You know, that's not a lot of money for, sure for, for a ton of time, plus all the stress. Plus, I would argue in a lot of cases, this, that performance isn't real. Yeah. It's, it's somewhat arbitrary. It's luck, yep, sure. You also mentioned in the book that accepting that you don't have the edge is the key Eureka moment. I'd agree with that. You know, it sort of boils down to know thyself, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, over to you on the eureka moment of accepting that you don't have the edge because a lot of people spend their entire life and they, they never get to that conclusion. Yeah. Why do some get there and some don't? You know, I just on, on that, I, I, I speak to a lot of new clients and they say, I'm so annoyed, Andy, that it's taking me to age 37 to realize. I'm so annoyed, Andy, it's taking me to 43 to realize, to, to 48. And I say, it's irrelevant. Yeah. Be pleased that you've got here now at 37. 43, 48. Some people spend their entire life and then, you know, pop it and they've never yeah. become a financial literate. Yeah, you know, I remember my granddad, he lived in southern Spain and he would he would love picking stocks. And then he would they weren't allowed to have accounts in Spain for whatever weird reasons. He didn't have a phone in his house, so he would drive down to the phone booth and furiously put coins in the machine to call a broker abroad and have that broker go and buy a stock and then several days later hear back. It's just flipping insane. <laughs> that was his ritual, though. You know, you're going into a whole other territory. Maybe there was, like, maybe there was some enjoyment there, right? I don't doubt yeah. that. He saw it as like a serious, being a serious steward of his wealth. Right? Wow. Um, but I think, first of all, very few people have any incentive to tell you this. Like, I don't make any money from this. Like, I literally don't make any money from this. And and, and, you know, if I was in the position where I was trying to manage people's money, well, you can get paid a lot more to do it actively than do it passively. Right? So, so one of the reasons is there's just very few people telling this story. Um, the second is, I, as I said earlier, conventional wisdom is an incredibly powerful force. And conventional wisdom is that this is, you know, you know being an active participant in the market is somehow makes you astute or clever. Compared to people, for example, at a dinner party, and one is uh, saying, "Yeah, I went down and 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 bet on horses on Liverpool to win a football match," and the next person says, "You know, I did a lot of work and I bought Google and I sold Facebook," and those might be equally informed choices, but I think most people would accept that the person buying the shares would come across as more astute or educated or smarter or something. And so there's a, there's a lot in there to suggest that that's, that's sort of the, the, something society values. Yeah. I mean, we see all the time with active managed portfolios, they're doing what I call overcomplicating for profit. You know, the 16 fund solution flies off the shelf. When they sit in front of us and we say, we've got the one fund solution that will be all funds out there. You know, it's it's a harder pitch. So we have to pander some ways to the human, even though, you know, we'll give them what they want a little bit, but long term you're getting exactly what you need and it's going to be simplify, simplify, simplify. Yeah, yeah we come across this all the time. Yeah, and then also, frankly, for your side of the business, it's harder to make money by doing the right thing. And it's much harder. harder, much harder. You know, um, uh, authenticity has cost me a fortune. That's that's, that's the nature. Well, you'll, you'll go to fund management heaven. And <laughs> yeah, I'll just be there with about six guys. So did we do it, guys? Yeah, we did it. Moving on, you do talk about the rational portfolio, and I think you talk about the rational investor, but we sort of covered that to some degree. I want to get into a few more things that we... May, may disagree about. So physical property, uh, again, I'm, I'm a fan of it. You know, I'm a fan of businesses and bricks. We've spoken about businesses, the great businesses, the great companies of the world. I'm also a fan of bricks, physical bricks, not property funds. Move on from that. Both businesses and bricks provide a rising income and a rising capital value, history being our guide. Over to you on the element of bricks being part of the portfolio. 
Okay, so, well, a couple of points. Well, first of all, so I disagree with you. Um, so, first of all, what? I disagree with you. Great. Um, now, okay, so for the vast majority of investors that own a house, the house is the biggest part of their portfolio, okay? Now, that's not always the case, obviously. If you're Bill Gates, the value of Bill Gates' house is probably a tiny part of his overall wealth. But for most people, that's not the case. Now, so think about where, so let's say you, so you live in London, in northwest London, you said, and you, let's say, well, I don't know anything about your personal finance, but assume for a second this is the case. You um, work in northwest London with clients in northwest London. You own a house in northwest London. You are subject to the laws of the land, I hope. <laughs> in the UK. Now, I suppose you, in many cases, you would own shares in London because that's the economy you know. Uh, your insurance companies would be in London. Your pension provider would be in London. You know, your annuity would be based somewhere in London. If there's one thing all of this has to in common. It's London, right? So now let's say you come across a great opportunity to buy a house up the road you've added incredible correlation risk to your existing portfolio. If London does well, you're going to be fine. If London does absolute crap, you're toast. Right? So you have massive, massive correlation risk in your portfolio already by having your biggest investment be where you live, where you're probably educated, where a lot of your investments are, where your car will have to be sold one day. Businesses. Everything. So for me... Even ignoring a view on the development of the property markets, that is a risk that almost can't make sense for you. Unless you have some magical insight that the London property market is going to storm ahead. Now, if you have that insight, go be rich. Go, it's a bit like saying, you know, which way Facebook is going to go relative to Amazon. That's edge. That's an incredible edge to have that insight. And I argue very few people or no one I've met have that. But let's say you do. Even so, suppose you're wrong for a second. The, the, the cost of being wrong is staggering. Now, that, take, take that one step back and say, let's talk about it theoretically or practically, historically, whatever you want to call it. And how well have property actually done? Now, property, like a lot of asset classes, we're hugely guilty of recency. You know, you know the London property markets over the last 20 years have been one of the most staggering success stories um, where um, we're Prices seem to go up and up and up as London increasingly became the financial global center. Everyone was probably going to tell you that they saw this in hindsight, even if they managed to somehow not buy a property at the beginning of that. <laughs> let's suppose for a second we had this show in Las Vegas or Miami, where half your listeners would be in default, right? Or in some of these other places where housing markets have crapped out. Not only would they be in default, but they would be in default because of this massive concentration risk and over gearing to something like property that they thought could only go up, up and up. So just because something is bricks and mortar doesn't mean it'll always go up in value. Just like just because something produces something doesn't mean that the value of that you know, producing asset can't decline permanent. Um, you know, it's, it's called capitalizing the value of something and, 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 and basically setting a value to the, the future, future uh, income streams. Yeah. And, um, so that's why I don't think you should do it. So if you, you know, but I also appreciate a lot of people. They, I mean, not I myself own my house, right? And um, and that's where my kids will grow up or are growing up. And you know, if that's somehow suboptimal from my portfolio theory perspective, then so be it. But it's it's what I want to do. So there's that element. And I get that. And mortgages make sense for a lot of people because it's super cheap funding, and they yep. all can afford a house. Like it, good answer. Let's now move on to the word risk, which crops up quite frequently in your book. I've done a lot of work around risk, informed risk and uninformed risk, and the word risk is just used too frequently <laughs> without unpacking it. Uh, I believe there's three flavors of risk, loss of capital, loss of purchasing power, and volatility. Frequently, the word risk is just associated with volatility, and it's not really unpacked. But over to you for risk. What's your thoughts on risk? You mentioned it quite a bit in the book. I think, well, I 
I think risk is a is a super hard topic to write about and even talk about in any kind of meaningful way that's generic. You know, risk is a I think often quite an individual thing. Mm -hmm. First of all, we feel differently about risk. You know, if we if you and I both had a hundred pounds to our name and and we lost fifty, we would react to that differently, even if we were twins. <laughs> and so, yeah, that means we have a different risk profile given the same set of circumstances and no one has the same set of circumstances. Um, I try to think of risk, you know, we can get incredibly mathematical about risk and I think mm -hmm. that obfuscates the issues. It doesn't help us. Um, so I actually almost try to be more holistic about risk and the stuff we talked about with housing before is sort of trying to be that, you know, you can put massive correlation matrices and, between the various assets, and if this happens to this, and that one happens to that, but it's no one knows. I, you, you can sort of ballpark it and say, yeah, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, and don't be stupid about it, and don't take a lot of risk, and you know, and cross your fingers. But in reality, I think it's it's um, you, there are a couple of things you can do. You know, diversify your asset and don't take a lot of risk that you don't think you can afford. Understand your own situation. Are you actually able to withstand a, a loss of income, a loss of capital? Are there certain things that you're sort of you know, in your, like if you, the example of you before with the housing and all your assets in London, like if there's somehow in your stomach, you're like, oh, I really hope the London economy doesn't go to crap. Well, then you're probably taking too much risk with the London economy. Or, you know, how do you feel about the stock markets dropping 10%? Are you exciting because you think you can buy more lower than you know, then you're probably doing all right. But if you're sort of saying, oh, crap, now, you know, this is, this, the world is going to hell. So I'm, I'm being incredibly unscientific. You know, I think historically the risk of we talk equity markets for, for a second, you know, people assume this beautiful normal distribution curve of returns. In fact, option theory was created on the basis of that. And it's just not true. It's just not how the world operates and the markets work. Um, so, so I know I've said almost nothing, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a hard topic. And I think it's one of these areas where individual investors need to talk to professionals, frankly, like yourself. Now, it's very, very hard to get right, and it's very, very hard to understand holistic. You know, I mean, even inheritance is a part of your portfolio, the prospect of inheritance. Sure. Your education is a part of your portfolio. Do you speak French as a part of it? Oh, that's probably a negative part. No, that's, <laughs> um, but it's you know it's so hard to to you certainly wouldn't try to put numerical values on all this stuff. Well, no, I suppose your vague answer shows that you actually understand the topic quite well. If you did, if you didn't miss a beat and just went bosh, this is the answer. Mm -hmm. Then it's a little bit more alarming. But then it's, it's, the next, next credit comes, so that's for sure. <laughs> a friend of mine wrote, literally wrote a book called "How I Cost the Credit Crunch," and it was. A lot of numerical stuff. Um, I mean, How he calls the credit crunch. Yeah, it's a guy named Ted Shishikawa. He's a lovely guy, actually. He wow. Called How I cost the credit crunch while working wow. at Goldman Sachs. He that would have... Uh, how impressed his boss as well. That, um, that, that would have attracted some, uh, some attention. You mentioned diversification. We'll touch upon it loosely, but uh, the main thing I want to get onto now is you mentioned in the book about avoiding fraud. We call this scam avoidance. So you pay a professional advisor and one of the things that their fee will probably pay for it in its entirety is something called scam avoidance. You have to have a very attuned scam ant antenna and frequently the most financially illiterate get sucked up by these things because they obviously seem fantastic. Again, you want to make a lot of money, set up some financial scams. You know, they're just, uh, you, you fill the truck up with the amount of money that you're going to get from them. Obviously that's not the right way to go about your life. So and you I'll just mentioned it. You go to prison. So, yeah, you just mentioned, well, you, financial fraud, you'll be there in, in and out in six months probably, but hey-ho. Um, avoid fraud, you just mention it as just avoid fraud and you go to it a little bit of detail. It's so hard for financial illiterates to avoid fraud, hence greed and all of the scams that we know, front pages of the money sections. It, 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 it's endless. We've not reached the point where... The humans are no longer greedy. So, yeah, yeah. any thoughts on the... I don't know if that will ever reach that point, but, but yeah. Yeah, no, we won't for a while anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, thoughts on the avoid fraud that you mentioned? Well, a couple of things. One is, 
again, an advisor is helpful. Um, the old saying, if it's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. But they can't work out what's too good to be true. They think... Well, okay, so let me, let me put some numbers yeah, on that. Right? So let's say, let's say you go to a brand name company and you do the things that I just told you to do. You buy for your investments two products. And one is an investment in... Now we're sitting in the UK, but it's true of any country uh, with some caveats. But... Um, yeah that you buy an exposure to the government bonds of your country. And the second is you buy a global equity index track. So just for some people that don't know what that is, an index is basically an aggregation of all the stocks that um, are out there. It's not literally true, but it's very close to the true. Put out together in the proportion of the value of those companies called the market capitalization. And you buy indirectly, therefore, thousands and thousands of companies. Okay. So at any one point in time, one of those or two of those will be frauds, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Again, one was. Um, but you're diverse about it across thousands and thousands of them. Then the next question is, is the provider that you buy this product through a fraud? Okay. So the provider in this case is a company called Vanguard. It's a company called you know, uh, BlackRock is a big provider. ICS. Yeah. Dimensional, yeah. These massive, massive companies. Now, could they be frauds? Right. So, is that possible? I guess anything in the world is possible. But if you're going to be a financial fraud, that's a pretty bad place to start. Is to to take zero point one percent in fees every year, and you know, I would say they're pretty much the back of the line in terms of places that I would expect fraud. Sure. Now you take these shares uh, or or uh, investments, so let's say you buy an ETF, a chain-straighted fund in Vanguard, and you put that somewhere, you can actually have it in custody. The way to think about custody is, in the old days, is where you would have the paper and put it. That was custody. Now it's obviously electronic, but, um, but it's a simple way to think about it. Now, could the place you have it in custody be a flaw? Right, so you can choose to have it in custody at Vanguard, or you could put it at a place like Barclays or any of these other firms. Now, could they be frauds? Sure. But these places are large institutions. And this, by the way, is always what people say before the large institutions are fraud. I get that. But compare that to a guy who comes and tells you on a, some sort of a coconut real estate deal on a beach in Brazil that promised you 5% a month until eternity. Mm. Tell you which I think is more likely to be a fraud out of the two of them. And which is more likely, and by the way, Throughout this conversation, neither of us have promised anything materially in terms of returns. We haven't promised anyone in the world. We, in fact, promised nothing. We just said it's the best way of investing, and we can talk about expected returns, but we're not making promises. Hmm. But anyone that comes to you and make promises of outsized returns, unless you're really, really understanding of the risks you're taking and why they can promise these outside returns and why they need your money, then don't do it. Avoid. The last question can easily be the most important one. Why do they need your money? I mean, there's a, I belong to a, a, I play tennis, and there's this tennis coach who come, comes up to me, and he's been offered this amazing investment opportunity where he's going to make 25% a year. And I'm like, I'm not going to say his name, but I was like, you're, you're not a wealthy man. Why do they need your 5,000, 10,000 pounds? Like, why haven't they hit me up? Give them my number. I don't like, you know, that would be a very short <laughs> I'm like, don't do it. Don't be an idiot. He sounds like my tennis coach. We need to have a game one day. Um, the three greatest words of the financial advisor, don't do that. <laughs> don't true. do no, that. Don't. The four greatest words, no, don't do that. Yeah. We are moving on from the main uh chunk of the conversation we're moving to sort of quick fire questions so over to you on a few things here um favorite books do you read a lot of books about money finance business what what what's your on that uh, no i don't read a lot about finance um i read a lot though i read a ton uh favorite books i will tell everyone read the book i'm currently reading it's called why we sleep it's phenomenal and if nothing will convince you if nothing else this will convince you to get a good night's sleep and the importance of that for your happiness and health go read it they're absolutely brilliant and understand it 
The book I read before that was called Factfulness. It's another fantastic book written by a Swedish guy who actually just died, unfortunately. But it's about how we Ralph all Rousing. view the world um, Brilliant. through a very negative prism. Um, and so it's actually a very happy story. I say that and that he died in the same sentence. That's kind of sad. But, uh, but uh, yeah, and so that's a great book. Uh, but I love literature. I love, I read a lot. Um, I'm actually trying to cut it down. Crazy as that sounds. Are you uh, dusty digital or audio? I, you know, it's, it's a funny one. I prefer um, paper, but just my life makes it much easier to read it electronic. So you're showing, you're you showing know, your age now. Yeah, I know, right? But, you know, <laughs> no, but, you know my publisher said this. this is interesting. The world of electronic publishing has stopped growing. It does not grow relative to paper anymore because various studies have shown that you take in the material better on paper. Maybe one day it'll come up with a new version where that's no longer the case. But I get um, that when I read. I read on my little, here's my phone, right? I read on this little thingy. Yeah. Um, and why? Because then I can read anywhere, right? I have it always on me. But it's kind of not the same. So, so audio books have not taken you yet? I've done, I've done audio books in the past. In fact, um, I was very keen on my first book to be um, an audio book. My brother's handicapped, so he can't read. Um, but he, uh, So I was very keen for that to be an audio book. And that actually got me into it a little bit. Um, but I don't actually drive a lot. And I think that's an area where audio books are just brilliant. Yeah, because the current book's not on Audible, is it? No, I don't. I don't no, it's not. I don't, I don't believe it is, unless no, you get no. something to it. It's always better when the author reads it. But... I don't know how they do all the graphs and stuff. Yeah, but... it's, it's just a bit of a whatever with that. People just will only consume via audio, so they're not bothered about the charts. Obviously, you want the people that you know sort of split between the two. But yeah. it, it... No, but I, I, I listened to the, what's the comedian's name, who wrote a very funny book, McIntyre. Uh, he wrote Michael. Mark McIntyre, he, he, okay. his book I heard on, on, uh, on the audiobook. Oh, and he actually talks it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah he has to. I mean, there's no way uh, someone yeah, else could do this. Yeah, stuff. Exactly, it's exactly. It's not in the written stuff. Um, if you want a good book on this, the Malcolm Gladwell new book, Talking to Strangers, is, oh, yeah. is, is a new type of audio book because it's almost like a form of podcast but it's an audio book. Normally with an audio book, the author just talks in entirety. Was yeah. it Malcolm, Gla Mike, Malcolm Gladwell's new book, when they need to talk to a policeman as part of the story, the policeman is actually talking. Well, so it's like a podcast format, but in, a, in, in an audio book. I think it's the first of this sort of genre. They're trying, yeah. to, they're trying to enhance the audio book experience, which I think, I think is brilliant. Um, oh, he's, a, he's a superstar, isn't he? He's amazing, yeah. Talking to strangers is bloody the, brilliant. The dog saw. That's what it. the dog saw, yeah, that's the that's the classic. Oh, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. A uh, couple of other questions. Um, what one money tip would you give to a group of children? Oh, God. Um, well, understand you don't have edge. <laughs> no, I, well, I'd say... No, that's good, that's good. How, how would you bring it to life, though, to, to the, for, for them? I would say understand that you don't have to try to do better than the financial markets and start saving early because the power of compounding is many people a lot smarter than me that said it's just staggering it the earlier you get started on that the earlier you appreciate the value of saving and spending less than you earn the better off you're going to be in life yeah it's literally one of the massivest number one behaviors the big domino spend less than you earn is the big domino in life it's certainly just, it's just tailwind <laughs> it's just Exactly, exactly. I don't care if you make 12 grand a year or 12 million pounds a year. If you've got that balance wrong, it's, 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 it's curtains. What do you wish you had learned sooner about money and why? Well, I, so I don't want to make myself a hard luck story because I've just been lucky in life. I was born to wonderful parents that, you know, have never, so I think it'd be a fake answer. If, you know, my, my dad was a very wonderful and frugal man who taught me a lot about savings. So I was literally that guy, like, putting money aside. I probably should have absurdly just completely contradicting my earlier point. I probably spent a little bit more of my money early on having fun and less money saving because it is all <laughs> yeah. the The thing that I've seen recently of a lot of clients is, you know, bad habits compound, you know, when people are, doing X, Y, Z, that's a bad habit. It just generally compounds and, and they find it very hard to break. So bad habits are hard to break. 
but also good habits are hard to break. So people that save, 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 discipline, discipline, they get to like whatever age it is. And we say, now's the time you spend and they, they can't break the good habit. So bad habits are very hard to break. And so a good habit. So a lot of people just continue these good habits forever. And then, you know, they, 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 they die, die with a lot of money far too much money. That's another point, man. Whereas some of the younger people approaching me now, like a, a guy at the moment who's 53, he said, very wealthy, he said, Andy, I want to die penniless at 100. It's very hard for a 73-year-old to say to me, Andy, I want to die penniless at 100. They're just, they're in this good habit that they can't break, save, save, save. Yeah. And it's like, no, now is the rainy day. Now's the time to spend the money you save. Whereas the 53, the 48-year-olds, they're going to come and say, Andy, to the penny, let me know. <laughs> Hundred dead, no money. Buy them an like? annuity. Sorry? Buy them an annuity that covers this, their spending. <laughs> and don't We're going to get into a whole other territory now, my friend. Okay, so final very quick, quick fire questions. You've got to choose one or the other. Is it about working hard or smart? It's about working smart. Lucky or good? I'd rather be lucky than good, but I'd prefer to be both, I guess. I'm not answering your questions. I'm aware of that. That's fine. That's, that's an answer. Rich or wealthy? Well, I'd say wealthy just because there's no noble wealthy, but there's noble rich. I like it. Thank you so much for your time, mate. That is the no, end of the pleasure. interview. Where can people find a bit more about you? We've spoken about investing, demystified the book on Amazon, not on Audible, et cetera. Mm. Anywhere else we can reach out to you? Um, well, a, a couple of years ago, I started a YouTube channel because my publisher wanted me to do some videos. And, nice. And so I sort of added videos to that kind of as a hobby. Frank, I'll probably add this one. And, um, um, so, and that's obviously all free. And so if you don't want to read a 200-page book on on finance, that's not a bad place to start. But yeah, I have a website. You can spell my surname. It's croya.com. Just on that, it's K-R-O-I-J-E-R. E-R. And yeah. Lars is in L-A-R-S. Yeah, the site is croya.com. But anyhow, it's on YouTube. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I don't really have an agenda with this stuff. I, I, I got to get better at the why question, but, but I, I enjoy it. No, I mean, from myself and the listeners, you know, as you say, you don't have to go out of your way to do this. So, you know, a huge respect for, for doing it. Mm -hmm. And especially what, where you're coming from and the experience you've had, um, you know, it means a lot to put to, put, 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 put together. So we, we hope some more is going to come out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the final thing I was going to say, are you on Twitter? Yeah, I don't use it. No. You don't use it. No. Okay, that's probably a good thing. Stick with that. You could swallow up your weekend. <laughs> <Joking. don't> <laughs> It gets, it gets quite uh, heated in the uh, UK personal finance space, but enough on that. You know, consultants arguing with practicing advisors, you know, this is what you should do. But, you know, we sit with real people. This is what we actually think you should do. Anyway, all fun and games. Thank you so much, mate. Um, I'm sure we'll be speaking again in the future. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.